Let's get into our thing. We're on the life of teachers. Paul. Paul is currently uh, over here in, where is Paul? There he is. Paul's over here in Ephesus, right? Right here. Okay. Um, this, is, this is in his third missionary journey. <coughs> We're in Acts, Acts chapters 18 and down through 21. Paul's hanging out over here in Ephesus. And um, we, um, we're going to get into 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read some stuff to you tonight. Um, let's first of all, um, we, know that we know from 1 Corinthians, that we're just going to do a little quick background, then we're going to head on into to the letter, that, uh, that at least Apollos has been in Ephesus. We know Paul's been in Ephesus. And from the content, we, we can suspect that probably Peter has been there. They, you remember when Paul talked about, some say I'm of Apollos, some say I'm of Cephas, and some say I'm of Paul. Okay, and it's not really logical to think that they were, they were sect, they were becoming sectarian with Peter and I have had, had any contact with him. Yeah. Okay, uh, now not that these men cause a sectarianism, right. but they were choosing sides. We do it in the body of Christ all the time. You know, you know, I'm of Hagen, I'm of Copeland, you know, well, um, you know, you know, and of course we got real cute and I'm a Copeland Hagen. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, so we, we, we talked about last week, we kind of got Paul up to about the right first Corinthians, but I did want to interject here. Um, first Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 says, I wrote to a forehand to you in, in an epistle to not, um, what's the word he used, gosh, You're talking about going blank all of a sudden. To, in, in, I wrote to you in my epistle to no longer accompany with fornicators. Now, this is in 1 Corinthians. He's saying, I wrote to you in my epistle, not the company of fornicators. Um, it is pretty evident we, we, don't ha- we don't have that letter. You know, there's a lot of speculation of what could have happened to it. But it's pretty evident it was probably a letter written when Paul first got to Ephesus to the church at Corinth to, um, to bring some correction, you know, getting word, coming back of what things are going on. It's a very uh, sinful pagan city. Yeah. Okay? And the church in the cultural context of paganism has to be the church and not adopt. See, one of the things we're doing in America right now is we're adopting the culture of the pagan world right. of America instead of being the standard. We cannot lower our standard. People say, well, you've got to be like them. No, we don't have to be like them. Right. You don't have to be like them to win them. You have to be anointed. Right. Okay? Amen. And, um, you know, and I look, I, okay, so if you, you know, if you dress a little more casual or something, but you don't have to be... You know, we, we get so whatever that we, if we let the world infiltrate the church, and this is what the church at Rome did a lot of, they would adopt the cult, the, 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 the ceremonials. Remember, you know, Halloween was, was really, it was all Hallow's Eve. They, they put it with a Druid, Druid holiday that worshipped the dead and, uh, you know, and ghosts and stuff, and it became Halloween. They, they, you know, they, did, they did them together. They kept putting church holidays in association with the local pagans' religious festivals. Have you ever heard of Mardi Gras? Fat Tuesday. You know, you know what it's in relation to? Lent. Fat Tuesday is the day right before Lent begins in the church. They all party hardy and get stone cold uh, sinful. And then they go spend 40 days in Lent. You know, uh, this, this is not the practice of the church. Well, you may get numbers, but you're not getting new births. We're not to become pagans to get numbers. Amen. We're to set a standard and call, and, and call the pagans in. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's a pretty harsh term, some people think, but anyway. Okay, so it's, it's like, you know, this letter was probably written right after he first got to Ephesus and heard what was going on over the church at Corinth. Remember, he spent a year and a half in Corinth. And so he, he's traveling back. He gets back to Ephesus. Paul, Apollos has been over there. Apparently, Peter's been through there. And then word's coming back because it's, it's, just, it's just across the, um, the gulf there or, or the, the uh, inlet. You know, between, you know, Ephesus is, is here and Corinth is over here. So it's, it's a straight shot in shipping lanes, right straight across. You know, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, 100 miles or whatever. I can't, I don't really know the, the distance. But it is just a, a shipping drive over. Uh, they probably make it in, a, in, in a, 20 minutes by plane now. But back then, it probably maybe take them a couple of days or whatever at sea to get across there. Okay? So word has come to Paul. Things are going on in the church. He sends them a letter. And, uh, and in that letter, according to 1 Corinthians 5, 9, he tells him, I told you not to company with fornicators. Okay? So apparently he had he'd been pretty strong with that in his first letter. That's all we know about the first letter because that's the only thing he cites. Okay? So we could say this, 1 Corinthians is really 2 Corinthians. 
And then when you get into 2 Corinthians, you find that there may be some internal evidence that there was a third letter to the Corinthians in between the second and the fourth, and the third, or for, between the first and the second, what we have now. So really, we could, have, we could be actually reading 2 and 4 Corinthians. Okay? But we don't have them, so we have first and second. All right? But anyway, I wanted to go on one loop to that because Paul, Paul gets there. He hears these things. He writes a letter. Um, uh, apparently, maybe Timothy took that letter. And then, then they come back, and, and then right before he leaves Ephesus, after two years in Ephesus, he writes 1 Corinthians. Okay? Um, so we have here... <coughs> um, uh, let me see. I said I wanted to... I wanted to maybe there was something I wanted to... The... Um, 1 Corinthians, I'm going to read to you just out of, this, out of this particular New Testament survey book, is the most varied in content and style from all the epistles of Paul. Topics discussed range from schism to finance, from church decorum to the resurrection. Every literary device, and we won't go through all that, it is thoroughly informal in its approach rather than being a set essay on theological subjects. There is, a, however, a central thing that uh, G.G. Findlay uh, says in his book, The First Epistle of Paul to the church, uh, Corinthians in the Expositor's Bible, he calls Paul's letter to the church at, at Corinth the doctrine of the cross in its social application. Okay? It reflects the conflict that took place when Christians experience, when the Christian experience and Christian ideals of conduct came in conflict with the concepts and practices of the pagan world. The, problem discussed, it, the problems discussed in, are by no means outdated, for they are still to be found wherever Christians come into contact with pagan civilization. All right? You know, in other words, the church, you know, so our, we, we are constantly coming in conflict with the way the world conducts itself. Does not mean we stop being and conducting ourselves the way we're called to conduct ourselves. Well, you know, that's what's, you know, we, you know we, we can't just go out here and tell them, you know, to stop fornicating. That's just not right. You know, we can't tell them to stop, you know, being drunk. That's not right. We can't tell them anything because, you know, this is their culture. We're not of their culture. They were in this world, we're not of this world. Okay, so let's go ahead. We'll go and get down to the different, um, go and get to the different slideshows here. If you'll take it on down to um, the uh, outline of 1 Corinthians, please. That's the last slide. All right. And we'll jump in here. Y'all ready to jump? Stand up and jump. All right, three of you did it. I mean, man, what's wrong with the church? We used to sing songs like, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Hallelujah. Now we're going, I can roll over the pew and roll under it again. All right. Paul called to be an apostle of, of Jesus Christ. This is chapter 1, verse 1, starting from there. Now the, the, the greeting is in, in the first three verses, and from there we go into the divisions of the church through verse 4 through chapter 4, 21. Okay, Paul called to be an apostle of, the, of Jesus Christ through the will of God and, through, uh, and, and so seethiness, <laughs> our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corneth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord, our, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf. For the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you were enriched by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you became behind in no gift. Don't you love Paul? He starts us out praising them for all the cool stuff they do. You guys are it. You don't even come behind any gift. Who shall also confirm you in the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there is no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and judgment. So apparently Paul found it important to come to a harmonious agreement about the things of God. Amen? Now, I know there's things, you know, we can come to that are just not important. You know, 
I mean, let's face it here. And if you believe in pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, it doesn't matter what you believe. When Jesus appears in the sky to capture the church away, you're going up if you're born again. I, I can't imagine that going up and going, no, no, I got another three and a half years. <laughs> Put me back. <laughs> Doubt it. Okay. All right. Yeah, go sit over there. You're in timeout. No. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, for it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe. In other words, there were, there were, there were people who went from Chloe's uh, house, which we, we possibly could be servants or, or whatever, that there are contentions among you. In other words, they got into strife about stuff. Listen, I disagree with a lot of stuff being taught in the hyper-grace teaching, but you don't have to be contentious. You can just be in disagreement and show what the Word of God says about it. You don't hate them. Right. I, don't, I don't hate people who preach that. Right. Amen. Uh, I, I know there are people who, who have just taken out venom against Pastor Hagen for what he has said. I mean, they get up and they start talking about, and make, it, make it personal. Make it personal. I'm talking about, you know, they talk about his weight. They talk about, you know, family issues. You know, anything they can just make up or come up with, they just slam him. And that's like, you know, that's, that's contentious. That's not godly. We can, we can be in a disagreement and, and, and debate scripturally what's what, but you don't have to be evil about it. Hello. Um, now this I say, <clears throat> now this I say, that every one of you... Uh, uh, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Remember, remember Cephas is the other name for Peter. Okay? That, that, that is one of the names of Peter. And um, so here we have them separate now saying, well, I'm, I'm Paul, I'm pa Apollos, I'm Peter. Well, we are Christ. You know, sometimes people do that stuff, it's so baloney. You know, they're, we're the ones that only got it right. You know, well, hogwash. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but uh, Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not other whether I baptized other. In other words, he's, he's kind of recounting. He's thinking, well, maybe I'm baptizing anybody, but I don't think I'm baptizing anybody else except these guys. These guys. Okay? This is not a, uh, I swear that I didn't baptize anybody else. You know, somebody had found somebody, you know, he said, I don't think I did. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. In other words, he wasn't saying Christ, we, we shouldn't be bad, we shouldn't follow the ordinance of baptism. He said, I wasn't sent to, to have people follow me in that sense. Okay? They're to, follow, they're to follow Jesus, and there's a schism here, and he's trying to make the point, we shouldn't be, you know, saying, well, it's, it's Peter, or it's, it's, you know, Apollos, it's Paul, um, so forth. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to them, to, unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Because okay, so he's establishing that people will reject the gospel of the, of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, you know, one thing we did in the, the charismatic word of faith church was we, kind of, we, we almost got anti-cross didn't really mean to. We were trying to say, well, I'm not, on the, I, I'm not at the cross. I'm on the throne with Jesus, you know. And, and I understand, but if, you're not, if we're not careful, we'll, put, we'll misrepresent something. Amen? And so we got people, we, we took crosses out of our churches. I have, we have one. We have a, it, it didn't work with this writing up here, but we have, we, we have a nice one here in the foyer hallway there. Um, because, you know, the preaching of the cross, it's foolishness to the lost, but it's the power of God unto us. Amen? He says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dis uh, disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after uh, that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Now, here we go. See, the, there's a worldly wisdom. Talk about this Sunday. How the, the, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is what? Death or destruction. Okay. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. 
See, here's where we've we got to be careful not to try to be cute. See, we think we're going to come up and, and, and present the gospel in a, in a way that the world's just going to fall down and lolled over it and go, oh, that's the greatest thing I ever heard. No, it's foolishness. And so it takes, remember this, they that come to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We're to preach the gospel. We're to preach the cross of Christ. We're to preach the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and offer it to all that believe. We're not to try to convince them through argumentative or debate up through debating you know we're, we, we can out debate you so we're going to offer it to you and debate we're just smarter than you we're going to give it to you in a way that you can't help but believe that jesus is the christ see if you preach it to the jews it's a stumbling block you preach it to the gentiles it's foolishness that's what he said so they had to make a choice to believe amen but that to us it's the wisdom of god because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Hallelujah. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Now stop right there. Think about Paul writing this to a Gentile, pagan, uh, Gentile church, primarily made up of Gentiles, in a pagan community, and he was the most qualified in the natural to minister to the Jews. Yeah. Who was the most qualified to minister to the, to the pagans? Peter! <laughs> Cut your ear off, man. I mean, cuss for Jesus. <laughs> Remember, he, what? Remember Peter, the Bible says, when, when, he was, when they uh, questioned him, at the trial of Jesus, and they said, well, you were with him, he cut, he, he began, uh, your speech does betray you. he started cussing. Amen? Blankety, blank, 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 you know, then he went out and wept, because he, you know, he, you know so. Peter, Peter was a fisherman, brawny, you know, uh, probably a man's man kind of guy, you know, just, you know, um, but God, you know who God sent him to? The Jews. So Peter goes to the Jews, the least qualified probably of anybody to go to the Jews. And Paul goes to the Gentiles, probably the least qualified to go to the Gentiles. See, God, God, God doesn't trust in your abilities. Amen? All right. And the ba verse 20, And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You better not start taking the Lord's glory. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellence of speech. Now, Paul, um, Paul has to, in his letter, defend his ministry. Remember when Paul was up at um, Thessalonica? What happened in Thessalonica? Do you all remember? On a second missionary journey, when Paul was in Thessalonica and he was preaching and getting the church started up in there, what happened? Judaizers came. Remember that? And so they went over to Berea. And what happened when they got to Berea? They showed up there. Don't think they stopped at Berea just because he went to Corneth. Are you here? There, now, now we have the internet. People do stuff on Facebook, and they, they, they put stuff out on Facebook. People will, um, they'll, they'll follow you all over, and anything you put up there, they'll slam it, and they'll put stuff all over it and all this kind of stuff. You know? So we have, we have that same bunch running around today. Same devil's still here. Okay? And so Paul, Paul ends up getting placed, you know, he said, I came to you. I didn't come to you with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Listen to this. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Paul's now beginning to argue, hey, look, when I showed up, you know how I showed up. I didn't come to you with in a great eloquence of speech. Amen. I came to you in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. You know that. You know how I came to you in the first time. But the little Judaizer guys got there, those, those, those people who hated Paul, claimed to be Christians and did everything they could to undermine his work, had probably gotten involved and started starting up strife and contentions. They'll come into churches. Listen, there are emissaries of the devil sent to churches. 
That went over big. Hello. I mean, Jude wrote and said that men, the evil men uh, have crept in unawares and they turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. You know? And, make, and really making it so it was occasion to the flesh. And doing it with, 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 you know, listen, people who come in and begin to do things with great eloquence and great, what, you know, stuff, they come in as, as emissaries of the devil to disrupt the church from doing what the church is called to do. Okay? And, um, Verse 6, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, that means mature, and yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that, came, that come to naught. We speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It was hidden from them. The supernatural you're talking about the Trojan horse of all Trojan horses. Jesus came and the devil took him and, and, and all the things that happened to him in the crucifixion and his death and his ascension into the region of, of the damned to pay the penalty for man's sin. And then God raised him from the dead. All that. And had the world, princes of the world known that was going to happen, they would have never crucified. They just let him walk around and heal people. See, he had to do it the way he did it in order to redeem mankind. And that's a whole other subject we can spend six months on. As it is written, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Now, yep, I have people quote that all the time. You know, we, we don't know what God's going to do. I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Read the next verse. I mean, my goodness, come on, people, just read the next verse. But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. So you can't quote that as an excuse not to know what God's going to do when it says here, he's revealed them to you by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man except the spirit of the man that's in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You can't quote that other verse in, in, in any confidence of it meaning you can't know what God's going to do. You never know what God's going to do. Yeah, I do. What's he going to do? Exactly what he said in his word he's going to do. Amen? He said, if I do this, he's going to do that. If I, if I give here, he's going to give there. If I, if I do this and, and submit to this, he's going to do this. I don't have to go, oh, we just never know what God's going to do. Because I hadn't seen it here, hadn't heard <clears throat> you talk about pulling the scripture out of context and just using it as, as an excuse blanket. Moving right along. Mary, you know, uh, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, take that right there and go over to 1 John where it says you have an unction from the Holy One and have no need that man teach any man teach you. That's what he's talking about. Not teaching out of man's wisdom, but teaching out of the wisdom of the Holy Ghost. He's not talking about, don't listen to anybody teach the Bible. Right. So you need, to, people just need to be, I, I, I keep saying this, and I keep saying this, and I'm going to keep saying this. People need to be better Bible students. Oh, yeah. They don't need to grab some little thing and run off, you know, well, and we, usually when people go off and say things like, God told me that from the Bible, First John said, that I don't need any man to teach me. It's usually because they don't want to be submitted. And they found a scripture, albeit out of context and, and out of relationship with the rest of the word of God, uh, that supports their narrative. And they just go out and say that, and they, they feel free, and they start telling other people, and they all get together, and they're all free together. It's like Nathan says, you know, he talks about how the, the, uh, the people who are, anti, he didn't use this term, but anti-establishment, you know, the ones who want to be against what their parents are and all this kind of stuff, they, they don't want to be, you know, uh, like the establishment, what they have become, they become an establishment in themselves being anti-establishment. Yeah. So they're, very, they're becoming the very thing that they say they don't want to be. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, they all just sit there together and, and talk about how great they are being what, not being what they want, what they, what the parents are, but actually being that by doing what they're doing. It's, it's just a little catch-22 thing there. Verse 14, now we'll read verse 13 again. But which things also we speak, not in the words that man's wisdom teaches, 
but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spirituals. But the natural, natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. For they are, uh, neither can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. He that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Um, discerned of no man. In other words, you know, you're, you're, you're discerned by the things of God. Not, not judged in the sense, you, you know, if you're out sinning, you can't be judged. We're so foolish. I'm telling you, if people, people just do better Bible studies, they wouldn't come up with some of the stuff they come up with. For we, he, who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Right. Yeah, who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? But we had the mind of Christ. Here's your answer. It's not that we can instruct the Lord from, and I, listen, I was sitting in the meeting when this happened. This is about 20, about, well, about 32, 33, or maybe 35 years ago. I was in a, in a missions conference, with a, and I won't call any names. It's not, this is not what we're about. Um, I have great respect. Now, they're all, they've all gone home to the Lord since then. But I have great respect for all the ministers that, that were in that room on that platform that day. I do. They've been a blessing to my life, tr done tremendous things for the kingdom of God. But there was, there was a couple who'd been on Mitchell for a number of years. And they were at this, this church of a well, well-known uh, minister uh, who had been a missionary, but also had a, had a church in the city they were in. And um, <clears throat> we're doing, I, I, we're getting a lot of, you hear that? We're getting, um, this couple was sharing on missions and stuff. And then we went along, and all of a sudden, the wife, in, in, in this dialogue of a question and answer, goes, I give God ideas. The husband turns to her and says, you give God ideas? Yes, and he likes my ideas. Now, the, the um, only reason that the wife didn't get barbecued was because of the love that the pastor, evangelist, missionary had for the husband. Gets up from his seat, runs over there, puts his hand on their shoulders, pulls them apart from the microphone, sticks his head in and says, they just flew in, got off the airplane, they're tired, they're going to the hotel right now. <laughs> Whack! Shut it down. Why? Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? We don't instruct the Lord. Amen? Any wisdom that we have that is in the realm where we can commune with God in the realm of wisdom comes because of the mind of Christ in us. So it's his wisdom anyway. You don't give God ideas. Lord, I think we ought to do this. And he goes, well, I never thought of that. That's a great idea. I never thought of that. If you did have an idea and he liked it, it's because he already thought that was a good one ahead of time. Now, so on one side of that, who hath, who, hath, um, known, who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? In the natural, nobody. But we're not talking about walking in the natural, we're talking about walking in spiritual things. He said, but we have the mind of Christ. It is not your natural wisdom that empowers you to do things for God, to walk with God, to walk in that realm. It is a supernatural mind of the Holy Ghost working in you, the mind of Christ, the anointed one in you that empowers you. And so he says, and he goes on and says this. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual. Now, remember, this is probably his second letter to this church. And they're just, paganism and, and, and practices of the world have entered into the church. It's a, it amazes me how people get so turned on to the Lord and want to be so close to the Lord for a period of time. And then somewhere in their walk, it's easy to want to go back. Remember, the children of Israel came out. Why? The Bible says that the things of the children of Israel were written for an example to us or in sample. When they came out of Egypt, man, they were happy to get out of Egypt. Get over there for a few days, get to a tough place. Would to God we were back in Egypt. We do not need to allow the carnality of, the, of humanity to draw us back to the things of the world. Amen. And Paul wrote to this church, and, and what we consider his second letter of 1 Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians being his second letter to them, I, brother, cannot speak to you as spiritual. But as under carnal, even as under babes in Christ. 
I fed you with milk, not meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it. Neither are you yet now able, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as mere men? Well, as men, the Amplified Bible says walk as mere men. For one saith, I am of Paul, another says, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. So neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. In other words, he's telling them, do not be looking to us as, in, in that way. And we're not God. We are vessels. We are, we are communicators of God to you, but we are not God. You don't worship me. You don't worship Paulus. You worship God. What we share with you is given what? As he's already stated. He came not with an excellency of speech, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that the wisdom would not stand in the, 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 they would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It goes on and says, we don't teach you the, the things that man's wisdom teaches, but what the Holy Ghost teaches. So it's not us. So don't look to us, amen, or get into man worship. Amen. We got to keep looking to God. Amen. Because if you get into man worship, a man can get off and say stuff. Now, um, there's a church in Tulsa a few years ago. Well, a number of years ago, there were about 5,000 people at one time. If I call the name, you know who I'm talking about, most of it. Or if you've been around the caring out circles at all, you would know. Well, they got off into some stuff, and this pastor had pre I mean, he, they had moves of the Holy Ghost. They had things going and blowing. I mean, it was a happening place. Yeah. The pastor went off to a, a meeting where homosexuals were. They invited him to come speak, and they washed his feet, and he came back and said, they showed me more love of God than the body of Christ says. And I'm going to tell you, I differ with that. I don't believe it. I believe a spirit's involved in that. You know, hello, and started moving from there and started preaching that everybody's going to heaven, got in, got really full blown into universalism. Nobody's going to hell, everybody's going to heaven. Church went from 5,000 to nothing. Did an, did an interview on, on, on national television with a major news organization, an over the air major news, not, not a not a cable, but a major news organization, and said, I can disprove everything I'm teaching you to from the Bible, but I know I'm right. You can't follow a man. I said, you can't follow a man. Hello? How do you, you know, this, this is, this, now this one is, is just publicly well known and documented what happened down in, in Charlotte. But how many people fell away after the, the, the uh, PTL debacle? Because they were following the personality. I'm telling you, we well, better stop following personalities just because they're on television and they, they call themselves Christians. Amen. We don't, you know, there's, there could be all kinds of stuff going on. You can't follow them because somebody's on television. We, we make superstars out of them. People, people follow Hollywood stars like they're, they're gods only because they're, they're big and on television. If you knew them in real life, you probably wouldn't like them. Because a lot of them, I mean, that's, no, that's not everybody, but a lot of them are jerks. They get to Hollywood, make a lot of money, all of a sudden they're, they're, they're heads of the local chapter of PETA. I'm, I'm the head of our local chapter, the people for eating of tasty animals. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's move right along. So then neither he that planteth anything, he that watereth, but God that gives the increase. He that plants and he that waters are one. And every man shall receive his reward according to his own labor. Now God does, let's see, see Paul's coming back here not going to go over here and say, well, it don't matter if you plant or water. He, he kind of balances this. The point being made is we're to follow after God, not after man. But he does say those that plant and those that water will receive the reward from God. So you do it because you're, sir, you're honoring the Lord. So he doesn't want, see, people will take stuff and they'll go off the deep end with it. If he just said that he that plants, he that waters is nothing, but God gives increase, they'll just lay, oh, well, we don't need to do anything because God's going to give the increase. Not unless you plant and water. So he balances that by saying, you know, he that planteth and watereth are one, and, they'll and, and, and they will receive their reward. And each shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. In other words, you're supposed to still do what God told you to do. For we are, for we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry or vineyard or, 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 or tillage or farm. You're God's building. 
Now, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid a foundation, another buildeth their own, but let everyone, listen, but let everyone take heed how he buildeth their own. For other foundation can no man lay than it is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, Paul's saying, look, I've, I laid the foundation of Jesus Christ. So and he's giving a warning to those coming behind saying, you take heed how you, you build on that. It's always easy to come behind a foundation that's laid and just put whatever you want on it, and it's not the intention of the foundation for that to be on there. I'm just going to do what I want to do. Amen. Uh, you know, look, I'm going to tell you something. If you put a foundation in for a two-story house, you better not build a five-story house on it. Hello? You know, I remember when they were building the Williams Center downtown in Tulsa, because uh, I was at Raymond back then. Uh, and, um, you know, they spent two, at least two years. You'd ride by, and none of the work was above ground. A big, huge hole in the ground. Because all the work was going down. They were digging down, 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 pouring rebar and putting rebar and concrete in and rebar and concrete, but way down. And then I came back a few years later, went downtown for a camp meeting or something, and they had finished. And all of a sudden, I, the whole time I was there, everything was down under the ground. When I got back, it, the thing was way up in the air. Okay, the foundation that's laid is what supports what comes afterwards. And Paul says, he says here, um, no other foundation can any man lay, but, uh, I'm sorry, he, but let any, every man take heed how he builds up thereon. For uh, no other foundation can anyone lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be, been, shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, whoso as by fire. Now, he's saying here, you come along, you put a bunch of stuff on it, and it's not right, it's going to get burned up. It's not going to stand. Know you not that you're the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, and the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For, this, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise and their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are in vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether of Paul, Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or, or things present, or things to come. All are yours, and you're Christ, and Christ is God. So, you know, here, here we are, we're through chapter 3. Paul's arguing his case, talking about the divisions here. And, uh, he's, you know, he's basically saying... Uh, warning those who, in other words, now this, obviously this letter was written, and he's letting the people know if you're in that church and you're causing, if you're building on this wrong, it's going to get burned up. Now you may think you're, hit, you're hot stuff and slick and cool right now, but when you, when you get tried by the fire of God, it's going to get burned up. Now you may still make heaven, but you ain't going to have nothing to show when you get there. You know? You come in and think, man, I had 5,000 falls, yeah, and they were all messed up because you weren't teaching the Bible. You're back in line, pal. You don't even get leftover rewards. You get to go to heaven. Don't burn in hell. Thank God. But you ain't getting no rewards for what you did. It's going to get burned up by fire. Hello. It's going to be interesting to see who sits where in heaven. When down here we have, we, 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 listen, we, the church in America, the church in America particularly, has become a man worshiping worldly uh, analyzing what success is. We determine success by what the world says is success instead of determining it by what the Word of God says is success. We, we value success by how big and how many people follow. God values success by obedience and doing what he said. How do you know that? Check out Philip. Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ, had a big revival, people getting healed all over the place. When they found out they had got water baptized and, and the miracles were going on, uh, they sent Peter and John to get him filled with the Holy Ghost. Right in the middle of that big old meeting, Philip, God took Philip and led him out of there. He went and got some eunuch saved out in the desert. One guy. 
I can't leave this big meeting. You got people now. I can't go to that church. You know, I, I got I got to maximize the effectiveness of my ministry. Now you maximize the effectiveness effectiveness of your ministry. Do what God said. If it's one person and you're doing what God said, that's the maximization of your ministry. If it's five thousand, that's what God said. That's the maximization of your ministry. But don't you come up with some worldly concept that I can't go to some little church that can't fly me in and pay my pay my Jet fuel and all this kind of stuff that God gave you the jet. Remember God gave you the plane? I think he can also give you the gas. I, I don't have problems with people having jets. I don't, you know, but, but don't, don't come to the churches and, and say, look, we're going to come. But it's going to cost you $2,200 in jet fuel. God gave us this jet. We're so excited to have this jet. I could fly you over here for $300 on, the air, on a commercial airline. Yeah, but we, you know, I have to be rested. Fine. If he, if he knew you needed to be rested, couldn't he provide you with a fuel? Now listen, there'll be bigger churches that have more money that can do more. But you know what? Do not limit your, your ministry based on how big and how small in, in this, this guise of maximizing your ministry. God can send you out to one. Everybody say Glory. All right, let's kind of move along here, and um, I don't think we're going to get through this whole chapter, but do y'all care? So let a, man account, uh, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. It, moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing, should I be judged of you or of man's judgment? Yeah, I judge not, uh, yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. In other words, there's been some things they've said about Paul. He's thinking, you know, can I put it in modern English? I don't give a rip what you say. All right? They're saying some stuff about him. He just flat out says, I'm, I'm doing what God told me to do, and I'm judging God. I really don't care what you say. And I don't care what these people who've, who've been traveling around behind me trying to mess up what I do say. Amen. And I'm not even going to judge myself by what you're saying. God judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come and both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then, and then shall every man have the praise of God. <laughs> the counsel of every heart. So if you've been doing something you shouldn't be doing or can't counsel in a way that's not God, it's going to get, be revealed. And these things, brethren, have I figured, uh, I have in a figure, transfer to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn to think, not think of us of men above that which is written, that no one of you being puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from one another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why didst, dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received? In other words, whatever they've got, whatever wisdom they've got, whatever revelation they've got that is of God, it didn't come from them in the first place, it came from God. So why are you glorying about your great whatever? We use, ministries, we've got to be careful. Remember when Brother Hagin taught, you look out for the three G's. The gold, the glory, and the girls. Okay? Watch out for money. Watch out for getting lifted up and proud about how great of a ministry you are. And how great revelation you have. If you've got revelation, it doesn't matter. It still came from the Holy Ghost to you. And it's not of any private interpretation in the first place. But we try to get real cute. And, you know, and, and I've seen, sometimes I watch people in meetings and, I, and I, I'm like, they, they act stupid about revelation. They laugh and giggle and think it's the greatest thing they've ever heard since peanut butter sliced bread, which is great to be excited about revelation. But I'm telling you, you need to go study it out and prove it out before you get all excited about it. And go, go off the deep end with it. I mean, you know, man, that was deep. What did they say? I don't know, but it was deep. It is too deep. You know? And this is, you know, we, we just have to, be, we have to be more aware that anybody that does have revelation, it came from God, and that, that same Holy Ghost that gave it to them needs to give it to you. And let him reveal it to you. Those in Berea were more, no, more noble than those in Thessalonica. And what? And when they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things be so or not. They went and studied the Bible out. They didn't just take it because somebody said it. You got people running around here saying, you know, well, 
I asked the Lord, the Lord told me, and they, and they, and they teach it as doctrine. They don't give any scriptural support. They just said the Lord told them. I'm sorry. The Lord may have told you that, and if you've got the scripture to prove it, that's great. But you better give the scripture to everybody else so we can study that and prove it out. Yeah. Heard one preacher say one time saying, you know, that their child was in the back seat, and they were doing something wrong, and he turned around and corrected them, and he turned around, the Lord told him, uh, you're not teaching them grace. Not to tell them that was wrong, but to point them of what would Jesus do. Well, I don't know. You're supposed to teach me. The Bible says the rod of correction drives rebellion from the heart of the child. He that doesn't spank his child hates his child. Now you'll come and tell me that you're, you correct them for doing something wrong, and by telling, by telling them something was wrong, you're not teaching them grace. I, I, I ain't got Bible for that. But people just oh, that's heavy. No, that's made up. You heard some thought of your narrative float through your head, and now you can go teach it as doctrine. And everybody's just all hung up on what you're saying and falling on every word that you say as if it was the gospel itself. It's not the gospel. The gospel is the gospel. The word is the word. Amen. No, my Bible tells me to spank them. Country language. Beat their butt. You believe in corporal punishment. Hit a child and you'll teach them to hit. No. Nope. The Bible says if I spank them, I'll drive rebellion out of their heart. You looney tune psychological wackos out there are the ones going in there, be their friend. And they won't, you, know, you can't spank them for biting in the daycare, so they run around and bite everybody. Because you can't stop the little terror. Because there's no re repercussions to them chomping down on everybody else. Whack their back in a couple times and they'll stop. Why? Because they figure out if I do this, that there's something coming that I don't like. We're going, to take your, we're going to take your playtime away. That's all right. I'll just play wherever I am. We're teaching them there's no consequences for actions. But I have a degree. <laughs> Educated beyond your intelligence also. So anyway, sorry. Not, didn't do a whole lot to endear myself to the psychological community, did I? Oh, well. We got to get rid of the Looney Tunes in the house. We need to stop having the inmates run the asylum. Then I'm moving right along here. As soon as I find out where I was. Okay, verse 8. Now you are full. Now you are rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign that we might also reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as is appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, unto angels, unto men. We are fools for Christ's sake. We are wise in Christ. But, we are, yeah, ye, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak. Ye are strong. We are, uh, ye are honorable. We are despised. Now he's beginning to be a little rhetorical and sarcastic here. Even though this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and, and, and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted. Now, see, in other words, they've kind of set themselves up as the authorities and Paul's just a, is a chump. You know, who are you to come in here and tell us? Then he comes back and says, now, yeah, here's, what you, here's, here's the position where everything is, but we're the ones over here serving. We're the ones paying the price and we're the ones laboring to bring you to the full knowledge of Christ. Um, being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat it. We are made as the filth of this world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. I write not these things unto you to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. In other words, hey, watch what you're doing. You're, you're, you're making a mistake. You're getting puffed up about what you have and what you know and what people kind of brought into the church over there, and you, you're disdaining the very one whose heart is for you more than anybody else. And I'm warning you. Hello. For I though, uh, for I for through, I'm sorry. For though you have ten thousand instructors in Christ, and see, we obviously this is happening because people come in and teach you things in the church. You have not many fathers. There are a lot of people who come teach stuff, and it's all because they want the glory. They want to be the head. They want to be known. They want everybody to follow after them. They want to be you know exalted. But in all of that, there's only a few fathers. 
And see, my, you send your kids off to college. You've got instructors there whose design is to tear down everything that you've taught them, every tradition that you've taught them, every uh, moral concept you've taught them, everything about their life and structure that you brought them up in. Their design is to tear it down, destroy it, and then rebuild them in their image. And they don't give a rip about those kids. They have an agenda. But you're the father or you're the mother, you're the parent. And you've labored to bring them up. And that's why I say, look, parents, be really uh, careful about what, how you send your kids off to school. Well, you've got to let them go branch out and be on their own at college. Or they go get drunk and they, they, they backslide and all that kind of stuff. And you're paying for it. You can get a good education in, in your hometown right here. You've got UNCG right here in town, state school. And you're not going to get a better education in, Green, in, in, in Raleigh than you are here. Let them commute and drive back and forth that house. Well, they need to get out on their own and learn how to be an adult. Not in that setting. That's not learning how to be an adult. Yeah. They've been planted. You, you just turned out all your training and dumped them into an arena where there are, there are agenda-driven people. Are you here? Who want the glory for how great they are as an instructor to, to turn them into something else. And they get tenure and they can't get rid of them and the stuff that's going on in the classrooms you have no clue what's going on in the college classrooms now even the high school classrooms because back when you 30 years ago when you were in school it won't like that not as bad it was like that to some degree you had the you had the crate listen who, who you know who led the hippie movement college professors they were the sexual perverts out there leading this whole thing and i won't even tell you some of the stuff they did that they wrote in journals and got published about and, and, and the things they were teaching the kids to do when they were high and tripping on acid. So they're evil men. Listen, and they come into the church. That same spirit gets into the church and people come in and they don't care if they destroy the church in the process of becoming famous and rich and have notoriety. That's what they're after. They want to be known as the one. Where was I? Okay. So verse 12, even to this, we're, we're back to verse 11. For even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, are naked, are buffeted, have no certain dwelling place, and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat it. We are made as a filth of this world, and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. I write not these things unto you to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul's now arguing his case. You got all these people coming over here teaching this stuff and telling, you, and telling you whatever they're telling you. And I am telling you they're an instructor, but they have not begotten you. I'm telling you as, as a father who's begotten his sons because of my love for you, because of my desire for you to grow into the things of God, I'm warning you to take heed about these things. Wherefore, I beseech you, listen, I beseech you, I beg you, be followers of me, but be, be ye followers of me. Now, again, it's obviously not in relationship to how he's talking about, I'm, I'm Apollo, I'm of Apollos, you know, where they're, they're, this becomes sectarian and, and, you know, that kind of thing. He's talking about follow me, and he even says in one place, follow me as I follow the Lord. Okay? In other words, he has established his relationship credibility with him in this letter he's reestablishing it i begot you now these other guys they're just instructors and basically they don't give a rip about you i begot you i've labored remember paul writes one place he's talking about all things along there, and he says and that and, and beyond all this the, the the that which comes upon me daily the care of the churches Paul's heart was for the, you know, and listen, people, people just don't get it. They, you know, they think because if you preach certain things or say certain things, you're mean or hateful. And Paul says some pretty strong stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, when we get to the Galatians, we'll say something that, you know, that we'll just cover something. We'll just get, we'll get real blunt when we say it. But he says some really strong stuff. But it was because he loved them. He had, he had their ultimate care and his concern for them and his care for them was strong. He said, I'm over here laboring. I'm over here being counted as the filth of the world. I'm over here being reviled. I'm being persecuted. 
You, they even think oh, this is the off scoring. But I'm doing and I'm continuing to do it. And I'm writing because I love you. You're my sons. Those other guys, they're just instructors. I begot you through the gospel. So be me, followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul saying, Timotheus, I'm sending Timotheus to re-instruct you on these things. Um, now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. <laughs> but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? Now, he's basically giving them a warning. I'm coming, and you better shape up. Because when I get there, I'm going to either lower the hammer or put my arms around you and hug on you. But it's up to you. I'm sending Timotheus over there to check things out. See, how do we get this idea that Paul just kind of said, oh, you're just lovely, you're just wonderful. You know, all we write to the church is you're just great. And, you know, if we're just teaching that you're righteous, everything's going to be lovely. He ain't talked about righteousness yet, except say that, you know, under, under us Christ Jesus has been banned us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification. That's about it. Rest of it's kind of getting up to the point where now he's letting them hold it in love. It's a chastisement meeting right here. He is chastising them. You have run off after these instructors, and now you consider me to be all these other things when, in fact, I'm the one who really cares about you. This is a very, very common trait of adolescent teenagers who rebel against their parents. Somebody else knows more than their parents and cares more about them. You know, and you know, everybody wants to be at so-and-so's house because their dad's cool. He lets us drink. He lets us watch porn in the, in, in the, in the basement. Says it's good for us. He's cool. No. He's a pervert. Hello. He, he doesn't care about you. He just wants to be light and be the one everybody thinks is cool. And then you get mad at your parents, that, that, that people get mad at their parents, because they say, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. And it's all because they have the care and concern about your future and your well-being and all those things. They begot you. And see, the same is true spiritually. And as pastors, pastors should be more concerned about the welfare of their flock than being popular. Hello. It's not always going to be fun. See, it, here's the thing. People say, oh, I just wish pastor was like traveling minister so-and-so. I can't be. Now, when I'm traveling minister, Pastor Ed, yeah. yeah. I can go out there and do all that too. Are you here? But the pastor has a responsibility to, to guard the flock. Yeah. He's the father figure of the, to the flock. He's got to watch over that flock. He's got to teach them the stuff they don't want to hear. Oh, bro, so-and-so came in and taught this and this and this and this. Woo, it was heavenly. Go buy all their tapes, become a supporter of their ministry, send half your money to them instead of sending them to the church because he just loved the way he preaches. He gets to tell you all the stuff you want to hear and all the, stu all the stuff that's good to hear and joyous to hear. Then you got your pastor here, and he's got to tell you, you can't do this. Well, so-and-so didn't tell me I couldn't do that. So-and-so is not your pastor. He's not going to get on a plane and fly over here next week if you go to the hospital. He's not going to marry you or your children. He's not going to bury family members. He's not going to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning when you, got, you, know, you pick up a phone, you call the number, you get their office. You call, most, most of you probably have my cell phone number. You call my cell phone number, you get answered at 2 o'clock in the morning. So the care that we have for you is because we begot you and we love you in Christ. If we didn't begot you, you've come here and become part of our family. We've adopted you. So you're adopted begotten of us. And we are care for you. So Paul's arguing against these ministers who are entering in and stirring up trouble and creating problems in the church and then demeaning Paul. Now, you've got to think, now, if he wrote a, correct, another, a previous corrective letter, it didn't go over real good, apparently. 
Because I'm, I'm, he's pretty strong on this one. I'm guessing his first one may have been a little more gentle, and they didn't receive it. They got, they got, got more arrogant, and so he's blistering them now. In love. Now, I told you the first time, stop doing this. I had one minister, a big ministry, and, and um, somebody on staff came into the office when they said, I need to talk to you. And they said, okay. They said, look, I was out with some people. Um, while we were out, they, they, they ordered wine with the dinner. I ordered some wine, drank it, and said, but I felt so convicted. But in case somebody saw us and comes to you and tell you, I want to come and repent. They said, fine, I forgive you. But if it ever happens again, don't even bother coming by. Just go get your paycheck. Okay, I forgive you this time. Next time, don't even bother coming by. You're done. Sometimes you just got to put the hammer down. But it's, it's love. It's to bring correction to bring stability. But you see, the people who just who don't care, all they want is, is you to follow them and to support their ministry and send them money and buy their tapes and stuff, they won't tell you stuff that you don't want to hear. That one ever big. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, a number of years ago, I had this woman running around and had oil and blood on her hands and feathers falling out of her clothes. And she'd say, feathers from heaven, feathers from heaven. And what, I mean, national ministries. And, they, and listen, I found out later that, that uh, dad told them, don't, don't, don't have her. And they were doing it anyway. Then she got exposed. Somebody went in with cameras, filmed her in a service, and they had super, super slow-mo cameras. In other words, they could record it super, back then, super slow-mo speed. So they recorded it, went back and took it frame by frame and showed where she was, it was all a gimmick. Totally discredited her because, you know, she was getting into the body. Christ people thought it was, saying it was a miracle. You know, blood, oil. Fall. Why? We don't have that kind of miracle anywhere in the Bible yeah. where People are bleeding out of their palms. You know, nowhere, in the, nowhere in the book of Acts do we have that they, that they bled oil, had oil and blood coming out of their, their hands so they could be like Jesus. But all of a sudden we start getting these kind of things. Watch out. And we're, we're stopping here. Did I finish that chapter? For the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. What will ye? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love or in the spirit of meekness? And, uh, and then verse 1 of the next chapter. Yeah, we'll just get in that next week. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay? We got, we got, here's Paul having to argue his case to a church he birthed. Spent 18 months at establishing. And now he, here's a couple years later, and, and they are a mess. And as one commentator said, you know, it's not um, that the, the church of Corinth uh, was there, the miracle is it survived with all the stuff that was going on in it. I mean, it was a mess, um, absolute mess. Can you all see that? Yeah. Praise the Lord. So <clears throat> Paul, Paul's got some stuff to deal with. So, but here, again, that, that uh, G.G. Fidley says that it, you know, that, that it, is the, uh, it is the gospel, of the, 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 the practice, the social practice of the gospel of the cross coming in contact with the pagan world. That these letters are, are about how we're to live. And people don't get mad with me when I tell you how the Bible says you're supposed to live. We just kind of walk in love. We'll, we'll, we'll cover more of that. Okay? Amen? You know Paul says in this letter, we'll get to this next week, that he said that if someone is a fornicator, and then he clarifies, a brother. See, you can't, you can't not be around fornicators in the world because they're sinners. And it's our job to go to them and win them. He said, but with for brothers who are fornicators, don't company with them. Oh, if I just go low on that, the Bible says don't company with them. As Paul said, if they're a brother and they're living, uh, living contrary to the word of God, they're fornicating, you don't have company with them. You don't hang out with them. Well, that's not love. Yes, it is. Why? Paul put that guy over, turned him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit be saved in the day of the Lord. That's love. Harsh judgment to stop sinning versus going to hell forever. See, people don't, we need to read our Bibles. We hear little messages on this or that, and we get all cutesy with it and that kind of stuff, and we, we miss what the Bible is really teaching. In this, way, see, this is how, if we teach the Bible in this manner, 
if you come out here, message on love, it gets parameters on it, and we don't get weird with it. We, I call sloppy agape. <laughs> 